speaker, my good friend Taylor Coy. Thanks, thank you, thank you. What's up, guys? Uh, my name's Taylor Coy, if we haven't met, I'd love to meet you after this. My favorite pie, lemon meringue. Yeah, especially when they kind of heat up the top, make it a little brown. Holla at your boy. Um, so I'm going to say the beginning of a song, I'd love to hear if you guys know the rest of the lyrics. So if I say, this beat is automatic, supersonic, hypnotic, funky, fresh. fresh. Okay, hey, faith-based group, faith-based group. Um, just playing. Who sings that song? Sierra. Sierra. Yeah, thank you. Funk, funk man fresh on it. So Sierra and I are actually friends. Did you guys know that about me? Pretty sick, right? Pretty random. All right, let's get into the talk. Um, no, if I say that statement, Sierra and I are friends, right, I'd have to back that statement up with some information or at least say, hey, here, here's how that's true. And so I had the great opportunity in 2016 uh, to go to a Seahawks game. Now I'm a Broncos fan, but when someone says, hey man, you want to sit in a suite in Seattle and watch the Seahawks play? What do you say? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, please. How do I get there? Let's do this. And so I go and I'm hanging out and Sierra is married to Russell Wilson. Yes, he plays for the Seahawks. He's pretty good. He's super short. And uh, so I'm sitting in this suite and I'm like, it's a half suite. So, so how the suites were working, I just learned all this when I got there. But there are full suites, which are huge. There's tons of food, tons of people. There's half suites, that are a little bit more intimate. You're kind of in a smaller space, you're hanging out. So I'm with my buddy and his family and some friends. And the other half of our suite though, which is blocked by glass, but it's see-through, so I can see who's there. It's Russell Wilson's box. And so there's like Sierra just <laughs> sitting there with a Russell Wilson jersey on. And so here's the picture that we got together. Um, we're super close friends. So there's me, there's Sierra. Dude, she wouldn't get out of my ear. I was like, stop. I love one, two step, get off me, I don't care. Um, so essentially, Sierra plus me equals friends. That's all I needed to show you to reveal that we are actually, we're buddies. Like, we text sometimes. When's the next album coming out? How's Missy doing? She kind of had that blow up about a year and a half ago again. How's she doing? Cool, that's cool, cool, cool. Um, and so when it comes to, to, to making claims or saying things, you have to be able to back it up, right? I was able to prove to you tonight, without a question of doubt, <laughs> that Sierra and I are friends, right? If you need the slide, text me, I'll send it in the group me, uh, just if you need to show your friends to prove to them as well. Um, but that's, that's how this works. So right, when I, when I wanna explain something or make a claim, man, I gotta back it up. I gotta be able to prove to you and show you guys that, that this is a true thing, that, that what I'm saying is actually true. And so how do we really know anything, right? We have to be able to verify what we say. We have to be able to show that there's actually something behind my words as opposed to just, well, man, I had an opinion or man, I had a dream that Sierra and I were friends. And everyone's like, dude, you're not actually friends. Again, this shows that we are. But it's like, okay, so dreams don't work like that. And the same thing applies to the Bible. So as we look at the Bible, again, a lot of us in this room, I have different varying opinions when it comes to what is the Bible, what's it about. Uh, but tonight we're just going to talk about why the Bible is reliable, why it's something that, that matters and applies to our lives outside of just being a holy book of a religion, how the Bible is verifiable in a variety of ways. We're going to walk through that tonight so that when we look at the Bible, I hope we look at the Bible at the end of this talk just in a different light and in a more proper light, in a, re in a right way. When we look at the Bible, what it is, it's not just some old book. Man, it's something that actually applies to my life. And so the Bible is verifiable. How is it verifiable? The first thing is just through preservation. And so something that's really interesting uh, when it comes to preservation, just the historical, the historicity, that's a word, I looked it up, I know. Historicity, use that next time. ACT is already done for us, but you'll see it again. Um, when it comes to, to looking at a, a, anything that's been written or anything that's of age, you have to look at this, is it preserved? Like, can we trust the preservation of what we're reading, of what we're looking at? So something that's amazing is one way that old, how old manuscripts are judged uh, is they're just compared to how many manuscripts do we have that are complete? How many manuscripts of this certain thing do we have that are complete that we can actually look at that and say, okay, this is verifiable through preservation. I can know that this is legit. We can trust it. So some of Plato's writings, Back in the day, again, things we read in, in high school for some reason, 
never once thought about Plato again until Jake was born, and that was with what you play with, not Plato himself. And so, when it came to Plato, we look at, at Plato, and we have about 30 complete manuscripts of his. They're about 800 years old or so from when he wrote what he wrote to the oldest manuscript that we have. And we can look at that and say, man, there's 30 of them. Sweet, verifiable, we can trust that. We believe in that, that's awesome. Homer's Iliad, another thing that we read in high school. Why, I don't know. I think our education system's broken, mostly because we keep reading Homer's Iliad. But <laughs> we do Homer's Iliad. How many of Homer's Iliad do we have to kind of verify that this is legit, we can trust what's been written? We have about 650 <coughs> complete manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. So we can look at that and think, dang, that's awesome. We're good to go. We can trust that through preservation. Now the New Testament, so the Bible has two parts. The Old Testament is kind of the history of Israel. And the New Testament is, is Jesus and what he did and what happened right after his life. And how many, does, if anyone wants to guess, and if you've heard this talk, don't guess, but how many New Testament um, copies do you think that we have in total? 5,000. 5,000. Hey, Marguerite, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're close. 24,000, actually. Yeah, copies of the New Testament. You're, hey, you're the only guess. So <laughs> you, you were the closest, absolutely. That's how that works. Um, we have 24,000 copies of the New Testament that we can look at. And it's not hundreds of years after the fact. It's tens. It's about a 50-year gap from when it was written to our oldest manuscripts that we have now, which is awesome. Again, through, through preservation, we can see that the New Testament is something that we can trust 100%, and it's more recent. And so the Old Testament, up until about the 1940s, there was a little bit more of a question because the longest time between our oldest manuscript and when we had the, the our oldest manuscript and when it was written was about 800 years. And so historians will say it takes about a thousand years for something to become fairy tale, like where it's just not true anymore. It might have had roots in what was true, but then it was changed. So we were kind of on the edge for the Old Testament. And so let's jump to the Middle East, 1947. And, and we're there, and some shepherd boys are chilling. They're walking around doing their thing with their herd. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, walking around. And dude, what do you do, fellas, when you're walking around? Nothing. You like hang out and you throw rocks. Like we all do that. And so we're like, they're grabbing rocks, they're just chunking them in caves. And they're just having a good time talking to their sheep. And uh, <laughs> dude, chunks, of, chunks this rock, starts, I'm sure he like turns to his boy and then you just hear, Kush! like what the heck, dude, it's not supposed to make that sound. And so they go into this cave. There's actually a group of 11 caves and they found these. This was not the cave exactly, but that's an idea of what we're talking about. That's a really far throw. Hey, great arm. Um, this is what they found. They found a bunch of jars full of oil. And in those oil jars were wrapped up linens and different writings. And it was crazy. What was so cool was they opened them up and it's the Old Testament. They had a ton of these. They're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. If anyone's ever heard of those before, this is what we're talking about. Are the Dead Sea Scrolls. They rolled them out. I'd read it for you, but we only have like 30 minutes tonight. And so, <laughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls, so this is kind of a big gut check for Christianity in general, because these scrolls would move the, the age from about 800 years old to maybe about 400 to 200 years old. So these manuscripts are like, okay, let's see if we can actually continue to believe in this, because man, <laughs> if this doesn't line up with what we have, Dude, that's messed up. Like all these people have made this commitment. They're trying to follow God. They're trying to follow Christianity in general and it's been in vain. People have changed what it said. And so they look and they set the Dead Sea Scrolls up and they set up what we have and they're just looking. And they're looking. Okay, well there's a spelling error. That's okay, that's, that's regional. Okay, tight. Okay, and they're looking. And it lined up perfectly. It lined up exactly as it should. And again, that gut check for, for Christianity in general, 1947. Man, we saw that the Bible was reliable. We saw that the Bible completely as a whole unit was exactly what it said it was. That it was something that we could trust. It was preserved and verifiable as a result of that, which is awesome. And God said this. So we're going to look at a quote from a historian first. And he says this. This is Craig Blomberg. Anybody? Uh, former senior research fellow at Cambridge University in England. Good friend of mine as well, Sierra and I and him hang out. <laughs> the texts of the New Testament have been preserved in far greater number and with much more care than have any other ancient document. So we can know 
that the texts of the New Testament have been preserved in far greater number. Again, we saw 24,000, that is insane, copies of the New Testament. And this is not some Christian dude. This is just a historian. This is a guy who's saying, hey, we can trust this just as an ancient document. And God said this in Matthew. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God called a shot. He's like, hey, everything else can disappear, but the Bible's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. And we can see that again today. It's the, it's the top-selling book of all time. And people for centuries have tried to get rid of it. People have done everything they could to try to get rid of this book, and it's still here. It's still around. It's still accessible to us. We can download an app and have it in three seconds. So the, no, the next reason why the Bible is verifiable is through prophecy. And so what prophecy is, is, is an Old Testament a uh, thing that happened that, that they would say, hey, this will happen in the future, and then it happens. And so a prophet would say, hey, here's what's going to happen. Check it out. And then years and 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 years later, it would happen. And so I'm going to throw up two verses real quick um, that describe something specifically. So I'll read it for us real fast just so we're on track. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. What does this sound like it's describing? Crucifixion? Yeah. It sounds like they're describing crucifixion, right? They've pierced my hands and my feet. It sounds like Jesus is speaking here. But let's look at another quote that's from the Bible. It says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, and my, righteous, by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. What's amazing is that, again, this is describing Christ and how he died, crucifixion. So. Back in Rome, when, when crucifixion was created, it was created around the time of Jesus was when they made that initial way to kill someone. But what's really awesome and, and interesting is that these verses are 1,700 years before that was even made. So prophecy, this was prophesied in, in the book of Psalms, the book of Isaiah, we're reading about who Jesus was and how he was going to die a century before it happened. And so the Bible's verifiable because of prophecy, because things that happen. And what's cool, because we already looked at this, it's verifiable through um, preservation. It wasn't something that occurred, and they're like, oh, crap, we didn't write that down in the Old Testament. Let me go erase the market and write down that, oh, this is how Jesus dies. Trust it. That's not what happened. They were able to verify that by just the age of the paper. It's nothing that they could have changed. They couldn't look at, okay, here's how Jesus died. Now let's change what the Old Testament said. Man, it's verifiable through prophecy. So we've seen that it's verifi verifiable through preservation and through prophecy. And it's just also verifi verifiable, man, that's a hard word to say, through history. Luckily, this is the last point for verifiable, so I won't have to say it much more. Um, through history. So here's some quotes. This is Smithsonian Institute. It says, Much of the Bible, in particular the historical books of the Old Testament, are as accurate historical documents as any that we have from antiquity and are in fact more accurate than many of the Egyptian, Mesopotamian, or Greek histories. These biblical works can and are used as are other ancient documents in archaeological works. What's amazing is the historical community of the world views the Old Testament and the New Testament as something that they can trust. So if you're working on something really old and you like want to know the location of something or you want to know where a king was or whatever, man, what's so tight is if you want to know about the Middle East at that point in time, man, you go to the Bible. The Smithsonian Institute trusts what the Old Testament says because it's just verifiable through the, his, the historical accuracy, where places were. Again, for 2,000 years, guys, people have been trying to stop this book from spreading. They've been trying to stop this message from spreading. And, and what's happened is people continue to find evidence that continues to back what the Bible says, that continues to back what we see here even in the historical setting which is not a ton of us, I'm sure, aren't studying history. But if you are, man, that's awesome that we can trust what the Old Testament says over some of these other things because it's more accurate. There's a lot of stuff when you read the book of Numbers or Leviticus. There's a lot of detail 
and I can sometimes fall asleep when I'm reading that detail. But what I love is that I know it's legit. <laughs> like, I'm not questioning the detail. It's just a little boring. That's okay. Generations of people, and he married her, and she had this many. I'm like, okay, where's Jesus? And so, <laughs> we'll get to him. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute said this, Sir William Ramsey, again, uh, I'm just kidding. We're not friends. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single biblical reference. Controverted meaning negate. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. This is just a second supporting quote showing us that when it comes to even archaeology, like when we try to understand who we were back at a certain time, the Bible is still reliable. The Bible is still something that we can trust. The Bible is still something that matters. It's not just a collection of old pages. It's something that we can see through preservation, through prophecy, and through history that is verifiable. We can trust the Bible, which is awesome. Excuse me, my second point, the Bible is trustworthy. So, another interesting fact, when we look at the Bible itself, was there were about 40 different men involved in writing the Bible itself, like physically putting pen to paper. And to see the continuity of the Bible, if you guys read it, which I would encourage you to, it's unreal. It is insane the continuity that the Bible has despite these different people writing, their different styles of writing, what things are referenced, it's unreal. But something else is that the authors had nothing to gain. None of these men on the left had any reason to lie or cover something up for writing part of the Bible. These guys mostly wrote in the New Testament. But all these men passed away. Peter was crucified upside down. He didn't think that he was worthy enough to die the same way Jesus did. So they flipped him. Andrew, crucified. James, killed by the sword. John, died a natural death in exile. He's the only one who wasn't murdered. He just died by himself on an island. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was crucified. Thomas, killed by a spear. Matthew, killed by the sword. James, crucified. Thaddeus, killed by arrows. Simon, crucified. Paul, beheaded. You don't die for a lie. No one's willing to sacrifice their life for something that's not true. And so for us, that's my son Jake. He's choking on a sucker. <laughs> he did not die for the Bible. He hasn't. He's not going to. Um, the Bible is trustworthy. None of these men, none of these men had anything to gain. None of them had anything to gain, but they paid for it with their lives. Again, think for just a second, what is like the worst thing you've ever tried to not reveal? The, the worst thing you've ever tried not to tell someone. And think how easy with a spear to your side or someone about to nail a, a or yeah, put a nail through your hands and your feet that you'd be like, okay, I didn't do it. Or okay, I did do it. Like you would, you would admit that stuff so fast. No one's willing to die for a lie. And so for these men to have done that, man, there has to be something about this book. There has to be something special about this book. Again, we see this scripturally as well. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter is saying, we saw this and we wrote it down. We did not follow cleverly devised stories. We didn't meet up and make some sweet plan to make a religion. That, okay, let's put all this work in this religion and we'll, we'll say that this dude died, but then he came back. We'll just make up this huge story. There's none of that. They're just writing what they saw. And that's why they're willing to die. They were willing to give up their lives because they knew what they saw was true. They knew what they saw was true. Psalm 19 says this, The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord referencing the Bible. It's reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Weird kind of way to phrase that, but that's cool. Um, even much fine gold. I'm going to start using that more when I speak. Uh, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Have you ever read a book and had those thoughts? <coughs> Harry Potter's tight. Don't get me wrong. I read them. It's sweet. I didn't have these thoughts when I read Harry Potter. I wasn't like, dude, more to be desired are they than gold. Dude, screw Snape, man. I would, I would rather read that book. I'm like, no, I've never felt that way. <laughs> the only time I've ever felt that, and I, could, I can relate to the psalmist, is when I read the Bible. Man, it's something about it. There's something alive about it. When I read it, it is 
This is all true, that the precepts of the Lord are right. When I follow what God calls me to do, it feels awesome. It's amazing. I feel incredible. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Man, understanding who God is, not being scared of Him, fear, but understanding who God is in a right way, a God who created the universe, I should be kind of nervous about that, right? A, man, a being who created everything to think that, man, I can know you in a relationship through Christ, that's awesome. But there's a, there's a right view of that. And it's more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. Again, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. That's awesome, man. It's better than food. It's better than riches. That's what the psalmist is writing, that the Bible is trustworthy, that we see what we see in it is, is awesome and worth it. Another reason, the Bible is inspired by God. So I referenced that we had multiple authors in here. Um, sorry, my page flipped. And so we're going to look at two verses that, that explain this to us. All Scripture is God-breathed. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16a, it talks about how all Scripture was written by God. God had the Bible written Himself. Again, we see this also in 2 Peter. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit helped these guys write the Bible. This was not something that was just planned out. And they're like, okay, cool, we'll do this, and we'll, do, we'll make this huge thing of this Bible with 66 books, and we'll make sure they all kind of line up. And the Bible itself is very organized. It's something that, again, I grew up personally around church, but never heard any of this stuff. And so the Bible, the Old Testament, what's so cool about it, it's kind of just the history of Israel. And you can read about, man, what it looked like when God chose Israel, and when people were following Him, and when they weren't. And I can relate to that, man. There are times in my life where I'm like, dude, I'm in it. Let's do this. And there's other times where, man, what's going on? Why am I struggling? And I can see that in Israel. It's awesome. A nation of people. And then again, the New Testament was Jesus, what he did when he came down, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for us so that we could know God in relationship because we were separated because of sin. Sin separated us. But we have the Bible to see what, what Christ did, that we can verify what Christ did. And then after that, it was people who were like, hey, I want to follow God and know him. How do I do that? That's essentially the whole rest of the New Testament. The people who are following God for the first time, the first Christians, and they're like, dude, what the heck are we doing? And he's, people are answering the question. Paul was a writer of a lot of the New Testament, and he answers those questions. It's awesome. So if the Bible is no ordinary book, then we have to take it seriously. When we look at the Bible, the ways that we can verify it through preservation, through prophecy, through history, We've now seen, again, biblically speaking, that the Bible is trustworthy. And we've seen that the Bible is inspired by God. He created it himself. And so when the authors had nothing to gain, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 50s, man, so many things have happened that for me personally convinced me very clearly that I can trust this thing. That this is actually something that I can take seriously and build my life off of. This isn't Us Magazine. This isn't Teen Vogue. Do they have good nail tips? Sure, yeah. I mean, my cuticles are on lock. <laughs> They're not. But, um, Sports Illustrated, great stuff. Go Thunder. Anyways, we can read those things and they're cool for like a minute or a week until the next issue comes out. There is no issue two of the Bible coming out, just FYI. There's no more stuff being added to it. And so I can read this and understand this and, and think through this and ponder these things and trust them and can build my life on them as opposed to just, hey, what's the flavor of the week? We don't have to worry about that. If we're reading the Bible, it's something that hasn't changed for 2,000 plus years now. So I can trust what's being said. I can trust that the people who also had the same questions that I had about the Bible got those answers that they were looking for. You aren't the first person to have the question that you have in your mind right now. And that's awesome that you're not the first person. Someone else has looked into that. Man, research what the Bible says. Read more about it. Try to understand what it's about because it's awesome and it's always worth my time. Anytime that I read the Bible, I try to do that every day. Every time I read the Bible, it's worth my time. I never want to read it and think, man, that just was stupid. That was dumb. Never in my life. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here, it's too much. I'm legitimately saying that just as a person who is trying to follow God. I've never read the Word and thought, what a waste. And so I want to encourage you guys to, to consider reading your Bible, which sounds very simple, and it is. But man, being disciplined is hard. Keeping to it, reading more. And again, if you have questions, we're going to have some application stuff here in, the, in a second. Um, but it's the awesome part of reading the Bible that we see God's character. 
We see who God is. We see His love. We see who Jesus was. We see what He did for people, how He loved others, how He viewed others. And man, we can be affected by that. We can read the Bible and know God. That's awesome. That's a really, really cool opportunity that we have. And we live in a country where that's not banned from us. We can keep looking into this. We can read the Bible and understand it. It's not something that we have to be scared of, like in the Middle East and even some Asian countries. Man, it's, it's banned. They can't. They have to be secret about what they do. We don't have to do that, which is really, really cool. It's an awesome blessing and opportunity for us. And so when we get to know the Word, we get to know God. And man, when we get to know God, it's awesome. We get to make that decision to trust Him. So I'm going to invite Joe up real quick to kind of give us his story of what that looked like for him to make that decision to trust Christ. So give it up for Joe. Thank you, Decoy, for that introduction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I kind of had that foundation of, like, faith in my life growing up. And it, it, for me, it was a lot of rules, and I was never really able to connect very well. And so I always felt that disconnect. And that, that kind of translated in, into high school. And around the same time, I started having these questions that were, like, bigger life questions, like, what, what is my purpose? Like, you know, what am I what am I doing here? And it was also around that same time that I kind of started having um, struggles. Just like I was, I was turning to the wrong things. I was kind of caring a lot about how people per, people perceived me as a person, and I let that affect me and dictate what I did. And so, you know, that that that, that kind of translated again into into um, um college. And, you know, it, it, I think it got to a point where just like being, being in a fraternity and like there's just a lot going on and I wasn't always making the best decisions. And during like a winter break, I kind of just, I kind of just had this moment where I, I called out and I was like, Jesus, if you're there, like I need you in my life. And about four days later, uh, one of my really good friends for the past four years in high school, reached out to me and said, hey, where, you are, where are you with your faith? And he kind of took a risk because we had never talked about this before. And I knew right there that that was, that was the answer to my call. And, you know, like a few days later, I said for the first time, Jesus, I give you my life. And I think since there, since then, it's definitely, I've messed up and I've fallen short of God's standard. But... I mean, just being being plugged into this community and just being surrounded by people who are seeking the same thing and have made that decision, I, I'm just very thankful for that opportunity. And I've definitely grown in my knowledge. SMC is coming up. And for me, that, that was an absolute awesome opportunity to just like finally worship without it being a little weird. And so <laughs> I, it, was, it, it was really cool. And I'm... I'm very thankful for that opportunity too. And that, yeah, kind of, kind of to wrap it all together. Um, because I made that decision, I have, I have very much been connected in this community, and I have found kind of my purpose. And I just, I try to, I try to live my life how Jesus would, and I have not regretted it at all. What? Awesome. Thanks, bro. Killed it. Awesome. And again, another way Joe knew what, what he was being called to or what it meant to follow Jesus was, was through the Bible and reading that. And again, hanging out with Joe for about a year now, a little over a year now. Uh, it's been awesome just to see him make huge strides and changes in his own life. Um, and so again, the- you should know that maybe you're the best.